So as I begin to read this illustration, begin to think about spiritual success, um, I found that there was this illustration. Let me just read it to you. Just kind of set the scene this, this evening. Um, it's been called the greatest rescue mission of World War II. Late in the war, American bombers were sent on a dangerous mission over in southern Europe to cripple the Nazi oil supplies. Hundreds of crews in flying tin cans soared through storms of anti-craft shells. Many American pilots were forced to bail from their shot-up planes. The injured airmen drifted by parachute into occupied Yugoslavia, expecting to be captured or killed. Instead, on, gr on the ground, remarkable rescue teams were re already in place. Uh, Serbian peasants tracked the path of the floating flight crews. Their sole mission were, was to grab the flyboys and bring them to safety before the Nazis arrived. Risking their own lives, the peasants fled and, and sheltered the, the downed soldiers. These rescued men were in friendly hands but on enemy soil. They still needed to escape. The story of what became known as Operation Highland builds towards a daring mission, a secret landing strip, and an uh, evacuation plan. Amazing, those Serbian peasants rescued every single American airman, over 500 in all. Amen. Here's a fascinating subplot to the rescue. The, the travel to the evacu evacuation site the airmen had to spend weeks following the Serbian freedom fighters who alone knew the path to the evacuation site. Despite the profound language barriers, the directions, the pace, the distance were in the hands of their rescuers. The, the men had been saved from their enemy, but the journey had just begun. They still had to walk to freedom. The story of the Operation Highland shields light, sheds light on the important spirituality to be rescued from something sets us on the path towards something. For the airmen, it was the journey of survival. For us, it is a journey to faith. The one who saved us is now calling us to walk. It's non-negotiable. Though snatched from spiritual death, we soon discover that the Christian life isn't an arrival, it's an adventure. Christ rescues us, and then he points us to the path of following him. So we're, as we look in this description of the three S's of spiritual success. I want you to gain some understanding. Most of you understand this already, so it's very simple, but we can see the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians urging us to walk worthy of the vocation to wherewith ye are called in verses chapter 4 verse 1. What that really means is God has called us so we walk in our calling. We walk worthy of that calling. Amen? Amen. God has called us, but we, as, as I talked about this morning, that we have today, we, we need to live for today, we need to strive for today, but we also need to live according to His will, but we have to live in a worthy manner. That's right. So here's some simple points. Number one is the first S, is salvation. Being rescued by God. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I think it's amazing that so many people are closet Christians and they say, well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to be offensive. Or I don't want to come judgy. I was watching a YouTube video uh, today about how this street preacher, he kind of looked like Moses and he had a long beard and a hat and he was in Las Vegas on the strip and there was a big party and this satanic group came and surrounded him and was mocking what he was doing. 
and he was standing for Christ and he was preaching the gospel, he was not ashamed. And they had upside down crosses. They were mocking the cross that he was holding. And he's still not ashamed. The question I have for you this morning or this evening is, you were rescued. Jesus saved you. Jesus, in fact, the word saved is also the word healed in the Greek language. Are you ashamed? Abby said this morning that she would be willing to give up her life for... Christ, are we all ready for that? The Helen that she was talking about this morning was a, a very interesting, long, drawn-out story about a lady who was called to China and took the long route around to get to China. And she uh, had two cents, two, two miser coins, and she put her hands on her Bible and says, God, uh, this is all I have. And she couldn't afford to go to China, so she went to the train station which would take her a long time to get to China. And she paid every time she got money for this train ticket until she was able to get train ticket. And then when she was able to get to the train ticket, she rode the train. She didn't have any money. She just knew God was calling her to China. And she got to the point where the train stopped and it was on the border of Russia and, 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 and wherever she was at, I can't remember, but they were in war. She could not cross over. What was it? It was Russia and China. Russia and China. She could not cross over into China. She was stuck there. In fact, they told her to get off the train and walk with all her luggage. It was many, many years that she finally got, I mean, she was picked up by a sex slave, by a pimp, then rescued by a stranger that, who put her on a ship to China. It was very amazing to understand that God rescued and she knew where she was called and she knew what she was supposed to do and she did what she could and God finished this calling. Amen. That's right. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We may never have to go through what Helen had to go through, but we have to understand that we should never be ashamed of what we believe in. We should always stand strong for what we believe in. We have nothing to be sorry for. Amen. We should be excited about what we live for. There's too many people out there going, well, I don't want to be offend I don't want to offend anybody. Yeah. That's right. The very fact is, I'm not going to offend them. I'm still going to love them. If you're offended by my speech or my attitude, I'm sorry. But I'm not going to change my belief system to, to accept what you're doing. Mm -hmm. This is the foundation which I follow. Yes. And this is what we, we do not have to be ashamed about. See, the very fact is everyone says that we should put this aside and live in the cultural society, what they tell us we should believe in. That's not what my Bible says. It literally challenged us to go against the flow. Yeah. To be in this world but not of this world. It literally tells us to go against the flow. We, we have to live this in this world. We have to reside in this world. But literally God is saying, hey, love your enemy. That's not what the world teaches. That's right. Literally it tells, you, tells us that love your enemy... And bless those around you. Do what you can. You don't have to accept what they're doing. Right. <laughs> Number two. Sanctification. Remember I talked about that we're in the world, but we don't, we're in this world, but we don't have to be part of it. Sanctified is being set apart for God. Hebrews 10, 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right, on the right hand of God. Being sanctified, set apart. We're very different. We're in a Pentecostal church. We already, when you walked in this door, you became different. When you proclaim that you attend First Assembly of God, you're different. I mean, 
My daughter received an email saying why Christian teens are faking speaking in tongues today. Because she attends a Pentecostal church. Really? What's the big deal? Either we have Jesus and Jesus lives in us and the baptism is real because we know it is. There's billions of people speaking in tongues. It's not some falsified advertisement. We're not doing it because we think it's cool. We're doing it because the Spirit of God lives in us. We're not saying, hey, we're better than you. What we're really saying is, and I use this in layman's terms, we're spiritual pigs. Because whatever God has for us, we want it, right? Whatever gifts God has for us, we want it. If, we, if God, if it says in the word, word that if there's a gift that you want, you ask for it, God will give it to you. I mean, come on. I, I love being, I love going to a spirit-filled church. But the very fact is we also need, need to be sanctified. We're so, the church today is living so close to the world that sometimes they don't know there's a difference. And that kind is sad. Yes. No, that's really sad. Yes. Because there has to be a difference. We always claim there's a line in the sand between the church and the world, but that line is getting blurred. Mm-hmm. We need to pray for the church today. Yes. Number three. Service. Being devoted to God. I beseech you, there, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Mm-hmm. Romans 12.1. Think about that. Service. What does that literally look, look like for each one of us? I know the fine print on your service could be work. But service is so much broader than that. Yes, there's work. But it deals with your life. It deals with what you do and how you act. Service is helping out somebody on the side. But that's not work. Because work is stressful and hard. Service unto God is peaceful and joyful and able to do it, right? Even though sometimes it's very frustrating. (laughs) Never, right? But the very fact is service unto God. Let me explain. My mom drove school bus for 27 years. (coughs) Service unto God. She worked in the church too, but service. Wherever you're at becomes service if you do it right. Tomorrow morning... If the Lord tarries, if the Lord doesn't tarry, you're going to get up and you're going to go to work. Or you're going to go to school. You're going to show up. You're going to do what you're called to do. You have a choice tomorrow. How are you going to meet the day? Are you going to look at it and go, it's another job. Or are you going to look at it the way God wants you to look at what you're doing? Your opportunity. Your mission field. You know the greatest example that you can do for your boss is give 110%. And then he goes, why are you working so hard? Are you showing off? No, I just want to get my stuff done. Or better yet, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for the Lord. Sometimes we get caught up and we think service is just in the church building. It is. We do need help. So don't negate that I'm trying to get you out of work for the church. But I also want you to rethink that a little bit. 
because your service can be beyond these four walls into where you work, into your place of business, into your school, into where you're at. Because so many times we, we negate this idea of service as being here. Service in the God really can be even better uh, defined as how do you live your life? Do you live your life? Now, we know that works cannot be your salvation. You cannot work your way into heaven. We understand that, right? Yes. So service is a way that you honor the Lord. That's right. Amen. I know, maybe you think, or you're thinking, wait, pastor, you get paid service, serving the Lord. Not all the time. Here I do. But outside the church... I may not always get paid, but it doesn't really matter. It's not about the pay. It's about the glory of him. Do you understand that? I'm so stuck on this right now, I don't even know why. Because I think we need to really comprehend this. Because defining this service, we can either be overwhelmed by it, or we can be completely um, misunderstanding. Misunderstanding because I'm, I'm trying to get you to do work. I have an underlining fine print. Basically what I come down here, here at this third point is, as the Lord said in this passage of scripture, is present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That's where it really comes down to. And if we have the opportunity to serve within the church, awesome. Praise the Lord. That's just one more place to serve. If you get to serve outside the church, that not is only a way to praise the Lord, but it's also a great witness of who God is in your life. If you get to ever get to go on a mission trip or whatever, it's a great opportunity because now you get to... See be used and serve in another country. Mm-hmm. What if God ever called you to wash someone's feet? Mm-hmm. Wash someone's feet who was diseased feet. Mm-hmm. How many would say that would be very difficult? And, and you knew that you were in another country, you were even here in the ghetto, and you knew there was a person that was a street person, and God said, that person, feet, is infected, and the only way they can be healed is if you are willing to love them by washing their feet. Never done that, but I'm just thinking, what if that would be an amazing thing that would cross that number one that would test your faith that would first gross you out because you're human and then as you get down on your hands and knees to this homeless person you may weep Number one, because God called you to do that. Number two, because you've never seen something so disgusting. You never know what God will ever call you, and that's probably pretty extreme. I've seen and heard people hear of a need, and they just kind of go do it. And they they don't even fathom. It's a service. There's a scripture in in the Bible that talks about that the angel may come to your door and knock at your door and ask for something to eat or ask for clothing. And would you feed them or would you clothe them? You never know when you're going to entertain an angel. Maybe that homeless person that you're going to wash their feet could have been an angel. Service. Next time you open your door, don't get freaked out. Maybe it is an angel. 
But the question is, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then if you go back to uh, Romans 1.16, which is in the first point, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation and everyone that believeth to the Jew and also to the Greek. For I am not ashamed. These three things, salvation, sanctification, and service, really all go together. Because they all work together. That's success. Spiritual success. Being rescued by God. Because we are, if we are saved, we've been rescued from the pits of hell. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen? Sanctify. Being saved, being sanctified is, a, is that you're being set apart. Being different than the world. Being in this world, but not of this world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Service, being devoted to God, allowing God to work through you and use you and let your life so shine. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? I hope this encouraged you. I try to bring King James in into it in the evening just kind of because I know some of you really enjoy King James and I want to challenge you with that. Um, but I want to just encourage you. Today, this both sermons this morning and this evening was really to encourage you. And that's my biggest prayer, is that not every sermon that I preach, you feel like you just got beat down and you drag yourself out going, man, this would have been a great day to stay home. My biggest prayer is that when you hear a sermon, you hear a message that you say, okay, God just spoke to me. Not pastor, God just met me here. And I heard what I need to hear. And I hope tonight that did the same thing for you. Because I never want it to be about me. It always has to be about the Lord. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for tonight. I pray that, Lord, that you will bless every person that hears this. Lord, may we be just in tune to what you have for us, Lord. We love you and we praise you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen.